All right, good evening, brethren. Um, so the title of my sermon tonight is There Is No Difference, For the Jews Require a Sign. And where I got the title from were these two verses here. Uh, so Romans 10, 12 from the KJV, true word of God. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Uh, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So I'm just going to say a quick prayer, guys. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, please fill me with your spirit. Um, and I, pr I pray that I can preach with clarity that um, your children here tonight would be edified and their faith in your word and, and courage and boldness in, in preaching it would be strengthened in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the reason for the title of my sermon, guys, uh, there is no difference for the Jews require a sign, um, is... I'm going to go to verses in the Bible that, uh, that show signs that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, as we all know, a lot of people that practice Judaism, or most people that practice Judaism, if not they'd be Christians, um, do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So what I'm going to do is go back to the Old Testament and show uh, different parts of the scripture, different signs in the scripture that point to Jesus being the Messiah. Okay, so just a little bit more of um, uh, ex using the word to clarify what a sign is. So in Exodus 13, 9, and it, shall be, and it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes. So a sign is a memorial. Uh, Exodus 31, 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So a sign is something that brings to remembrance, something that uh, brings knowledge to the, pe the people um, beholding it or, or doing it. Um, just really quickly on the Sabbath there as well, guys. Um, the Seventh-day Adventists look at the Sabbath as uh, a part of salvation, a requirement of salvation. But if you read that verse, it says that they were to keep the Sabbath and it was a sign to them that they may know that it's the Lord that doth sanctify them. Not worshipping on the Sabbath day, but the Lord that doth sanctify. And it was a reminder unto them. Because as we know, when we read in Hebrews 3, chapter 3 and 4, it points to Jesus being the true Sabbath, the true rest, in whom we uh, rest in and believe in for salvation. All right. So the overview of my sermon. Um, it's quite dense, guys. So especially the first point. So I just pray that you would... Um, you know, try and pay attention. I hope I preach it with as much clarity as I can. But, you know, if you, it, it really clicks with you what I'm actually saying and what, what the teaching is, it really is a blessing. Um, uh, like I said, it, it is to show the signs in the scripture that Jesus is the Messiah, but it's also pretty um, special to me personally uh, because what I learned from the 69th week, uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel and, and the end of the 69th week, was actually what convinced me that the Bible is the true word of God. Um, so I hope it's a blessing for you here tonight. So yeah, the 69th week, I'm going to look at Isaiah 52 and 53 because there are other chapters that um, point to Jesus being the Messiah. And this one last sign um, for the Jews, um, and it's, it's a bit of a hidden message, it's pretty cool. I uh, hope you like. Um, so guys, the gospel is for everybody. The gospel is for everybody. All right. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The only way we are reconciled to God is through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. That is the only way. And the Jews don't believe that Jesus is the son of God. Um, and the Bible says, he that hath not the son, the same hath not the father. So they can say that they believe in the father, but if they don't have the son, word of God says they don't have the father. So you need to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You need to believe that he's the Son of God. You need to believe that he died for your sins in order to be saved. All right, so the gospel is for everybody. Now, I just want to touch on a quick um, uh, debate that was in history. It was the disputation of Barcelona uh, in 1263. And it was, a it was a Christian Dominican friar, Pablo Cristiani, and he had a debate with Rabbi Nachmanides. Uh, now, Rabbi Nachmanides, he's, um, I think he's revered as a, you know, someone that the Orthodox Jews, at least, look up to as someone that's you know, a sound teacher in their doctrine, that sort of stuff. Um, and these guys had a debate of whether Jesus was the Messiah. 
I haven't looked too much into it, but just briefly, I think where uh, the Dominican friar sort of fell short, I don't think he converted Nachmanides. Um, I don't think he believed on the Lord. Uh, but I think where he fell down is that he tried to show Rabbi Nachmanides from the Talmud that Jesus was the Messiah. But what I'm going to attempt to do is show from the Old Testament uh, that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, sorry. Okay. All right, so the 69th week of Daniel. Now, if you guys have your Bible on you, if you can turn to chapter 9, um, just so you can follow along. If you don't, that's fine. I'm going to read it out for you. Uh, so it's Daniel chapter 9. We'll just have a quick drink while you're doing that. So it's Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to read the whole chapter, okay? All right, so Daniel 9. <clears throat> In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, I think that's in, it's either, it's in Jeremiah 29, but it's also in another part of Jeremiah where God actually said that's... Um, God actually tells them that it's going to be seven years, uh, 70 years, sorry, they were going to be in the captivity of Babylon. Um, but then it would, you know, obviously, as history tells us, they would go into the captivity of the Persians. All right, it will come 70 years of desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now, it's very subtle there, guys. Um, but, but like I just sort of went over, God told Jeremiah that it was going to be 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Um, and I think at the... Sorry, not Jeremiah. Yeah, he told Jeremiah, but Daniel read it in Jeremiah, sorry. Um, and he told, uh, So Daniel is at a time uh, under the Babylon captivity, and he realises that I, there isn't much time left of the 70 years. So there's already, there's already been a, an X amount of years, and he realises that it's coming to an end. It's coming to a close. Um, and like I said, there's something real subtle there. Look, so even though Daniel already knows... What is going to happen after reading Jeremiah? Uh, yeah, I've got the notes here. It's Jeremiah 29.10. He still prays. He still prays. And that's a good point. Because we know that we are coming to the end. All right? We don't know exactly when, but we know that we are in the end times. And we know that we will go through tribulation. All right? But we can still pray. We can still pray for boldness. We can still pray for courage. We can still pray for miracles that God will give us power in the end times and protect us in the end times. He can do anything. He parted the Red Sea. Um, so this is the point I want to bring up there. All right, so I'll continue reading. So starting from 9, verse 4. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day. To the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel, that are near, and that are far off. Through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even, thy de even by departing, that they may not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done, as hath been done upon Jerusalem." As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. 
Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and hast gotten thee renowned, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousnesses, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. Because for our sins and for our iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present, for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was speaking and praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. All right, so we see Daniel is given a heartfelt prayer uh, when he is interrupted by the angel Gabriel. And he's saying, we have sinned. We have Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets. We all sin, guys. We all sin, which is why we need Jesus. Um, which is why we need to preach the gospel to our family and friends. We need to get them saved. So, but he's acknowledged his sin, and he's acknowledged us by God's mercies that we are forgiven, that we are saved, and that by his mercies and righteousnesses that uh, we're allowed to live. All right, and he informed me. So this is Gabriel. He's interrupted his prayer, right? And Gabriel gives him a really important message. Um, when you look at the King James Bible, I think the word Messiah is only used once or twice, and I think it's actually in this chapter. So it's pretty important when you want to sort of identify and, and, and prove who the Messiah is. You want that sign of who the Messiah is. It's really, really cool. Um, all right. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. There's that 70 weeks there, guys, and I'm going to be um, going more into uh, in this sermon. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So seven plus 62, uh, three score, sorry, a score is 20, three score is 62, seven plus 62 is 69. Um, now, I don't exactly know why God broke it up into the seven weeks and the 62. I think it has something to do maybe with you know, the temple and, the, and the, the walls being built. Um, but nonetheless, that seven years is there. Uh, but in total, it's 69 weeks. All right. Uh, three, so two, uh, and after three score and two weeks, so after the seven weeks and then the three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Cut off, I think uh, it, it's referring to death. Be killed. All right, but not for himself. We know that he died for the sins of the world, didn't he? He didn't die for himself. He died for us so that we could have a place in heaven. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and the end thereof, uh, sorry, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abomination shall he make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, I'm going to the part where Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Um, now, when you look into prophecy and all that sort of stuff, guys, uh, the last week hasn't started yet. Uh, it, says he, it says, the prince of the people that shall come. Uh, this, I believe, is a reference to the Antichrist. 
he shall confirm the covenant with the many, all right, for one week. So that's the 70th week. As we know, the Antichrist isn't here yet. They still need to build the temple in Jerusalem. All right, so the 69 weeks have been fulfilled because the Messiah was cut off for us. Okay, now important points um, from chapter 9, especially in regards to the 69th week and then the Messiah and what I'm going to prove from scriptures here today, is in 924 we see that the 70 weeks are not finished because in 924 it states to make an end of sins. I ask you a question, have you stopped sinning yet? None of us have. We sin every day. All right? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So the 70 weeks can't be finished because it says that, in, that it's got, at the end of the 70 weeks, it's going to be an end of sins. Does that make sense? All right. So 925, the next, the next important point is 925. The commandment to restore and, re and build Jerusalem is the commandment of Nehemiah 2, 1, ver uh, verse 1 to 8. All right, the only commandment which stated that both the temple and city would be rebuilt. I think there's other decrees and commandments in the scripture, another two or three, uh, especially the, the decree that was given to Ezra. The thing about that one was is that it was only to restore the, the temple, not the city. I think this one, the one in Nehemiah 2, which I'm going to go to later in the, in the sermon, is the one that, that um, we talked about rebuilding the city. All right? And that's what it refers to, restore and build Jerusalem. Okay. And, and like I've already sort of said, guys, only 69 weeks have been fulfilled of that because that 70th week, you know, the three and a half years tribulation, that sort of stuff. I oh, know so. The three and a half years and then the great tribulation, somewhere in the midpoint there. Uh, but yeah, so 69th week, 69 weeks. All right, so these are all the points I'm going, going through, guys. Like I said, it's quite dense, so I'm going to try and get through it as quickly as possible. But um, yeah, just try and pay attention because it's, it's unreal. Trust me. All right, so first point was that I'm going to make is it was already written, and I'll explain what that means shortly. Uh, what's in a week? So what the prophecy is actually referring to in regards to the week. How many days in a year? Now, this one's a little bit interesting. I'll, I'll go to that, and I'll show that from Scripture. Um, a bit of a recap on what we've learned from those three points, and then we'll go on to the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, which is when I'll go to Nehemiah 2, uh, unto the Messiah, the Prince, an important concept, to um, keep in mind when we're doing the calculations, um, Jesus' ministry, all right, and again, doing the math, I've done the math for you guys, so you don't have to stress too much, um, and Sir Robert Anderson's findings, which is, which is unreal. All right, so it was already written. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so just going from um, BibleArchaeology.org, it says the so-called Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek is traditionally dated to the reign of Ptolemy II Philadelphus of Egypt, 285 to 246 BC. Okay, um, another uh, bit of text here as well, guys, from Britannica.com. Septuagint, abbreviated LXX, meaning 70. The earliest extant Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Torah or Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, was translated near the middle of the 3rd century BC and the rest of the Old Testament was translated in the 2nd century BCE. Now, why did I go to those bits of text? Okay, so this is basically proving that the Old Testament was in black and white in the Greek language at least 200 years before Jesus came. Does that make sense what I'm saying? That's why I've gone to that. All right? Now, what's in a week? Now, a week is simply a set of seven. All right? According to the Word of God, there are not only weeks of days in Genesis 2.2, 2, Exodus 20.11, but also a week of weeks. You find that in Leviticus 23. A week of months, Leviticus 23.24. And a week of years, which is in Genesis 29, you'll find in Genesis 29, uh, verse 20 to 30. Now, the week of weeks and week of months, you sort of got to read into it to sort of see that it's a week of weeks and week of months, but it's pretty strong, the week of years. It shows that um, a week can not only mean a set of seven days, but also a set of seven years. All right? So if we go to Genesis 29, uh, verse 20 to 30, it says, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. 
And it came to pass that he took his daughter Leah. So we know the story that Jacob worked seven years uh, because he wanted to marry Rachel, right? But um, Laban played a trick on him. He gave him his eldest daughter Leah. Uh, Jacob didn't realise until he had laid with her. He woke up, he realised it was Leah. Um, and then they had a bit of a, an argument, as we know the story goes. And Laban said, it must, not be, it not must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Then he says, fulfil her week. So he's talking about fulfil Rachel's week. And we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. So you see how he's saying, fulfil another week. But then he's defined it that it's another seven years. You see that? So a week is just a set of seven. The con you have to read the context to see if it's a set of seven days. It's usually a set of seven days. But in this case, and in case of prophecy, I'll show you um, when I go to a verse in Ezekiel, it's referring to a set of seven years. All right? Okay. All right. So just going back quickly to the, the 70 weeks of Daniel. All right, we're going to interpret the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy within weeks of years. Okay? Because we have examples in Scripture when God uses the term day in a prophetic sense and he is actually talking about a year. Also a week, he's talking about a set of seven years. All right, so Ezekiel 4, 5 to 7. Um, this is when Ezekiel, uh, one of God's prophets, he had to prophesy against uh, Israel and Judah. Um, and he says, For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. All right, here, look what he says here. And I have appointed thee each day for a year. All right, so I think it was forty years iniquity, but uh, Ezekiel had to lay on his side for forty days to show each day for a year. You see that? Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. All right, how many days in a year? Right, how many days in a year? So I'm going back to the flood. Okay? Genesis 7.24 And the waters prevailed upon the earth and 150 days. And 150 days. All right, Genesis 8, 3. And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. Okay, so basically those two verses show us that the flood lasted 150 days. All right, with me so far? Okay, Genesis 7, 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. All right, so we know the flood in total lasted 150 days. This verse shows us, 7.11, that the flood started, so the fountains of the great deep were open, uh, were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. The flood started in the second month on the 17th day of the month. Genesis 8.4, And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month and upon the mountains of Ararat. So 7.11 shows us when the flood started. 8, 4 shows us when it finished, all right? So with the second month, 17th day, it makes it easier because it's the 17th day. So it's the second month and it ended in the seventh month. So you do the math. 7 take away 2 is 5, all right? So it lasted for 5 months. It lasted 150 days. It lasted for 5 months, all right? Okay. Actually. All right. So like I said, five months. Now, if you divide that, what's 150 days, five months. So you divide 150 by five, you get 30, okay? So each month was 30 days in each month at that time. Now, you're probably looking at me and thinking, there's, look, not every month has uh, 30 days in it, Anthony. Okay, so this is why I go to... Um, there's some other text and other evidences here. All right, so it's webexhibits.org. Um, it says, In the 8th century BC, civilizations all over the world either discarded or modified their old 360-day calendars. The 360-day calendars had been in use for the greater part of a millennium. 
All right, so uh, before eight, the 8th century BC, 800 BC, it's saying here that there were calendars of 360 days. All right, so why did early civilizations around the world use calendars with months of 30 days and years of 360 days? These calendars seemed to function well until sometime in the 8th century BC when suddenly it became necessary to change them. All right, now, if you've looked at the old ancient Mayan calendars and other calendars from ancient civilizations around the world, they all had 360 day years of 12 months and 30 days in each month. All right? Now, before I lose my train of thought, now I've got down here two um, links. The second link is actually pretty, pretty cool. Um, it, in order to explain, you have to, I'd have to do another sermon on it. But this guy in the second link, he's actually looked at, all right, so he's looked at the, um, you know, the calendars changed in 800 BC. Um, and what actually happened in 800 BC? So there's two things that they think, um, you know, other Bible scholars think that why the days of the year changed. Um, they either attribute it to Joshua, you know, he said, sun stand still. And, and, you know, the, there was like a whole full day and, and the sun didn't go down for another extra day. Um, some lean towards that. I tend to lead towards the, um, and this is what the second link shows, uh, Hezekiah, he was, a, he, was an, he was a king in Israel. Um, and there was a time in his life where it became apparent to him that he was going to die, right? Now, when he realised he was going to die, he prayed to God. And God's response to that was that he gave him 15 more years to live. And you do the math, and I think it was around 800 BC when this happened. Now, God said to him, um, I will show thee a sign, you pick it. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the story. Um, and he says, shall I make the, the shadow go 10 degrees forward or 10 degrees back? And he sort of says, well, it's a light thing for the, for the shadow to go 10 degrees forward. You know, no one will, would really notice, would they? It's just gone a little bit faster. Oh, the day's gone a bit faster. So he said, make it go back 10 degrees. Um, I've sort of seen the, the sundials, how they used to sort of measure the time and stuff like that. I think it sort of goes like this. And at each step, it was an interval of, um, I can't remember the exact time, right? Um, but he's asked for the shadow to go back. So the shadow has gone back. Now, why I say that second link is pretty interesting, because this guy goes through it and he, and he does all the math about if the shadow went back 10 degrees, how much time that would take up. And that actually accounts for the extra five and a quarter days each year. Yeah, so look, it's pretty intense. I don't have enough time to go through it now. Um, but, but yeah, if you, you do get the time and you, and you do want to see the link, I can, I can give that to you. All right? So a prophecy recap. So the week, the 70 weeks of Daniel are weeks of seven years. All right? And the years are 360-day years. And you only got to go to Revelation as well. You know how you've got the, I think it's the 1,260 days, the time, times, and a half a time. Time, times, that's three years, half a time is half a year, and then it, it likens it to the 1,260 days. Now, that's, you can only say that's three and a half years if you're taking 360 day years. All right. Okay. So, yeah. Week seven years, year 360 days, 69 weeks. So, total number of days would be 69 times 7, which is the 7 years, um, the 7 in each week, and then times 360 days, you know, the 360 years before 800 BC, um, and prophetically, and then you've got the 69 weeks, which is 173,880 days, all right? So the reason why I'm doing this math, guys, just to go back. So in the 70 weeks prophecy, it says, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, Unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So 69 weeks. So what I'm saying here is that it was 1,700, sorry, 173,880 days. So from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that's how many days it took until the Messiah, the Prince. All right, the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, so here it is, uh, Nehemiah 2, verse 1 to 8. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, that's really important there, 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, 
And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favour in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. So Nehemiah, he's, he's presented himself to the king. He's downcast. He's sad. And the king's, pretty much, and the king's asked him, you know, why, why are you so sad? And he's saying, well, why shouldn't I be sad when the, the city of my people lies in ruins? So he's asked him, can I go back and rebuild the city in the 20th year of Artaxerxes? All right? And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon thee. So the king granted him. He wrote the decree. He gave the commandment. So that is the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. All right? Now, as you saw there, it was in the 20th year. All right, so this is from Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so Artaxerxes I, the younger son of Xerxes, was raised to the throne in 465 by the vizier Artabanus, the murderer of his father, during the reign on Artaxerxes I. The Jewish religion was definitely established and sanctioned by law in Jerusalem on the basis of a firman granted by the king to the Babylonian priest Ezra in his 70th sorry, in his seventh year, uh, 458 BC, and the appointment of his cupbearer Nehemiah was governor, as governor of Judea in his 20th year, 445 BC. All right, so his 20th year. Okay. So it's saying that the 20th year of Artaxerxes was 445 BC. So the commandment to restore, restore and build Jerusalem in the 20th year of Artaxerxes in 445 BC. All right? Unto the Messiah, the Prince. All right, so unto the Messiah, the Prince. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. All right, so I've, the dot says, because I've obviously missed out a whole heap of verses, and um, they're coming down to 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. Okay. So I'm looking at Tiberius now. Tiberius, Roman emperor, was born on the 16th of November, 42 BC. Tiberius ascended the throne at the age of 56. Okay. Now it's the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. What we're looking at, he ascended the throne when he was 56. Okay. All right. So 56. So he was born in 42 BC. He ascended the throne at 56. All right, so what, I would, what you would do is you would say, all right, 56, 42 BC, you take away 42 from the 56, and you get 14, but you have to add 1, and I'm going to show you why. So then you would get 15. So um, the first year of Tiberius was 15 AD. So that's the first year. And the 15th year would be 29 AD. Now you're probably asking me, so why do we have to add this extra 1? All right, so that comes to the important concept. All right, so we've got, you know, I'm glad that shows up there. All right, so we've got here, all right, so mathematically, you've got your negative, negative three, negative two, negative one, you've got zero, and you've got one, two, three. Now, if I was to say, let's sit at negative one there, okay? If I was to say um, negative one plus two, negative one plus two, you get to, Positive one, wouldn't you? All right. But if I'm sitting at 1 BC and I say two more years after 1 BC, what you've got to realise, that blank space there, is that there wasn't a 0 AD or BC. It went from 1 BC straight to 1 AD. So if I add two years onto 1 BC, it's actually 2 AD. Do you see that? See how it's one extra? Yeah. So that's where I get the, the extra one. Okay. Because there's no 0 BC or AD. All right, so that's important to remember when we do the math. Okay, Jesus' ministry. Now, we know that there were three Passovers within Jesus' ministry. Uh, we see those in John 2.13, John 6.4, and John 11.55. Um, so, yeah, look, just, just going back to that, sorry again, guys. Tiberius, all right? So he was, what is it, 42 BC. He was 56 when he was raised to the throne. Um, 56 take away 42 is 14. We add that extra one because we're talking in the, the years and we don't have that zero in between. So it's 15 AD, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar would then be 29 AD because the 15 is the first year, yeah? 
So you'd add 14 to get to 15. So it's 15 plus 14 is 29 AD. All right? Hope that makes sense. Okay, so like I said, the three Passovers, 2, 13, 6, 4, 11, 55. Therefore, we would have to conclude that Jesus' ministry lasted around three years. Okay? So the 15th year was 20, 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was 29 AD. Three years after that is 32 AD. Okay? All right. 32 AD, keep that in mind. All right. So this is just from Wikipedia, guys. A chronology of Jesus typically has that sorry, a chronology of Jesus typically has that date of the start of his ministry estimated at around AD 27 to 29 and the end in the range of AD 30 to 36. So what I'm saying, going through the different references in, from uh, secular history in the Bible, the ministry started in 29 AD and ended in 32 AD. And that sort of lines up with what Wikipedia says. And a lot of people say that Wikipedia is not a reliable source, uh, but it's got all the references underneath where it sort of gets stuff from. All right, so doing the math. Okay, so the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the start of it was 45 BC, remember, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. The 69 weeks, the time period, so from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Seven plus 62, 69. So the 69 weeks, like we've added up earlier, is 173,880 days from 45 BC. So the next dot point there, um, no, it doesn't show up there, where it's got 173,880. So we divide that by 365.2422. What's that number? Okay, so that's the amount of time in a year. 365.2422. Now the reason why I'm dividing it by the time of, you know, I'm using the 360 days for the, the prophecy, but I'm dividing it by the 365.2422 is because the calendars changed in 800 BC, didn't they? Now the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem is 445 BC, so that was actually given um, after the calendars had changed from 360 days. All right? So what we get there, when we divide the 173,880 by 365.2422, it equals 476 point, you know, I don't really want to go through all that because your heads are probably hurting as it is. All right. So then we get that answer. So that's how many years from 445 BC that the 69 weeks last, how long they go for. So then we, div sorry, we take that and we take away the 445 BC, but then, 445, but then we add the one, remember? Because of the negative, you know, we've got the numbers, but with the, the years, there's nothing in between. There's not, there's not that zero. All right? So we add the one and we get to 32. That's telling us 32 AD. You see that? The 69 weeks from the 445, um, 445 BC, the 69 weeks, um, to the very year Jesus Christ ended his ministry, 32 AD. Now, I, know, I don't know if that sort of made sense to you guys, but when I, found, when I looked at that, that, I just thought that was unreal when it was showed to me. Um, when I looked at this, so this guy, his name's Sir Robert Anderson, he was a Christian from Scotland. Um, he did a little bit more study into the matter. And what he said, that the decree was actually on the 14th of March, 445 BC, which would mean that um, the 69 weeks ended on the 6th of April, 32 AD. Now, what's important about the 6th of April, 32 AD? All right, so the 6th of April, 32 AD, when you convert that to the Jewish calendar is the 10th of Nisan in the month of the Passover. Exodus 12, 1 to 11. 
It says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. The tenth day of this month, a lamb. I've got the highlights and the underlines of what that actually means. So the fourteenth day they shall kill the lamb. It is the Lord's Passover. You know, when you look at the, the scriptures and the gospels, um, do you know what happened on the 10th of Nisan? Apparently, that was the day that Jesus rode in on the donkey and he was declaring himself the Messiah, the Lamb of God. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but that just spun me out, for lack of a better word. So, using the calculations that I did, at the very least, you've got to admit that God foretold the year that Jesus would present himself, that the Messiah would come, that the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the, God will, the, sin of the world will come. And when you look deeper into it, as uh, Sir Robert Anderson did, he's actually calculated that on the very day he rode in on the donkey, fulfilled that 69th week. Praise God. All right, now Isaiah 52 and 53. Now, I don't have time to go into it, guys, but at the back end of 52, Isaiah 52, and going into 53, and I think the whole chapter of 53, um, it talks about God's servant. It talks about God's servant. Now, I, I bring up this Rabbi uh, Moses ben Naaman, which is Nachmanides, you know, the guy that, that had the debate with the Christian friar um, earlier that I mentioned earlier in the sermon. Um, I bring up this guy because he's, he, I think, in, in Judaism, he's revered as you know, someone that they look up to in um, uh, interpreting the scriptures and that sort of stuff. Um, all right, so Rabbi Nachmanides, I'll just read a little bit about him here. It says, um, was a leading medieval Jewish scholar. He is also considered to be an important figure in the re-establishment of the Jewish community in Jerusalem following its destruction by the Crusaders on uh, 1099. So he's an important figure in Judaism, this guy. All right. Okay. Now, in a text titled the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, according to the Jewish interpreters, Nachmanides, so that same guy, has been quoted as saying, so this is how they justify it, Judaism. The right view respecting the parasha is to suppose that by the phrase, my servant, the whole of Israel is meant. So this is what um, modern mainstream Judaism sticks to. All right? So it's talking about the whole of Israel. But then he goes on to say, as a different opinion, however, it is adopted by the Midrash, which refers to the Messiah. It is necessary for us to explain it in the conformity with the view there maintained. And hence Isaiah writes that he will be high in the understanding, enabling him, enabling him to comprehend the deity. The text continues, referring still to the Messiah. So this is still him writing this. As many, as many were astonished at thee, their astonishment was shown by mocking him when he first arrived. Now when you read Isaiah 52 and 53... He admits that in the Midrash, what one of their script, I don't know what, what this is, it's one of their texts that they, they rely as holy written scriptures. It admits that it's talking about the Messiah. When you read 52 and 53, I don't know how you can come away with the conclusion that the Messiah is none other than Jesus. Because uh, the, the modern view of, of the Messiah in Judaism today is that the Messiah is not going to be mocked or spit upon or bruised for our iniquities or, or taking away sins. I think it says something like um, um, he'll be in atonement for sins or something. I can't remember exactly what it says. Their idea of the Messiah is he's going to come back and he's going to rule and reign straight away. Well, then they've got a problem because they have to um, try and make sense of that in light of 52 and 53 because it says the Messiah would suffer and die and be punished. All right, one last sign. One last sign. Look, so guys, look, thanks for your focus. Hopefully I haven't rushed through it too quickly and I hope it did make sense. Uh, but look, it, it was definitely what convinced me that the Bible is the word of God, just, just by how accurate 
uh, God's prophecy and God's foretelling and, and God's word is. Um, but I've got one last sign here. Um, and I'm going to have to apologise. I'm going to go a little bit back to the Hebrew. Um, but it, it is a bit of a blessing. It's, it's not trying to change interpretation or anything. All right. So 1 Chronicles 1, verse, four, uh, verse 1 to 4. So it's Adam, Shesh, uh, Sheth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Henoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. All right, so look, basically that is just um, from Adam to Noah, the genealogy. All right, the, the son of Seth was, uh, Adam was the father of Seth, was the father of Enosh. All right. When you go to the Hebrew and what their names mean, Adam means man. Seth or Sheth, uh, that's Seth there means appointed or set down. Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalil means um, the praised one or the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Henoch means teaching or commencement. Uh, Methuselah means his death shall bring. Now there's something really cool about Methuselah. Well, it's probably not cool. It's actually probably pretty sad for those back during the time of the flood. When he died, so his name means his death shall bring. And you do the math, the very year that, he's, that he died, the flood came. It's, it's quite insane. Um, so his death shall bring. Lamech means despairing. Noah means comfort or rest. So when you take what they, those names mean, you sit them next to each other. Now I've put a couple of words in the middle. You'll see, like they're, they're in black, um, just to make the sentence flow and make sense. You look at the message, what it says. It says, man is appointed more to sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching, his death shall bring the despairing rest. How cool is that? And if that's not Jesus, I don't know who it is. All right, thanks for listening, guys. Um, let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just pray that um, uh, the sermon tonight was a blessing, um, that it would, had edified the, the brethren here tonight, um, and that... Uh, you could just be with us for this next week, Lord. Help us um, in, our, in our problems and, and struggles and uh, walks of life. Pray that you would be with us as we read your word and, and preach your gospel. Give us opportunities and wisdom and, and courage and boldness to preach your word, Lord. Um, I just also want to pray that you, you bless those that are consistent with the soul winning, uh, that went out today and preached to the lost. Um, then I, look, whether there was soul winning or soul warning, Either way pleases you, Lord, because it is your commandment. I just pray that you would bless them for that, and I pray that you would bless us and help us um, through the coming week and uh, weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen.